Welcome, folks, to another episode of the Pixel Drone Show, the show where we talk to industry professionals about how they use their drones. And our guest today, I'm excited, is Basil Yap. And uh, Basil is a, we met through a friend of mine uh, that I went to college with, Chris Fernando. I know he'll like having his name mentioned. And uh, <laughs> Basil is the Beyond Program Manager for the North Carolina DOT. He's also the Vice President for HofCon Consulting. And Basil, by trade, is a civil engineer. We won't hold that against him, but he's also a podcast host for uh, the No U-Turn podcast, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And you can hear, you'll hear in a second, he has a, a voice for radio. So, uh, Basil, welcome to the show. Yeah, a lot of pressure now with the voice for radio. But uh, yeah, I really appreciate being on on here and have appreciated re watching this particular show and uh, very insightful. So yeah, excited to chat with you guys today. Awesome. Well, before we dive into all the cool things you've been doing recently with drones and uh, the aviation industry in general, can you tell us how you get involved with aviation in the first place? Well, I always have had a passion for aviation. Um, it's funny, one of my first memories um, I have is sitting on my grandfather's lap watching a propeller spin up. And this was when we were living in Hawaii. And aviation was a big part of flying between the islands. Um, and so that's one of my earliest memories and have always, uh, have just always had a passion for aviation. So when I was uh, in high school, worked at an airport, um, always, uh, loved going to air shows. And as you noted, I, I went to school to become a civil engineer. And when I was going through that program, um, you know, traditionally you think of civil engineers as building roads and bridges. And, you know, I don't know if this happened to you guys, but you get, two, three years into a program, you're like, why am I even in this program anymore? And so I was really fortunate to uh, have an intern internship with um, the North Carolina Department of Transportation uh, within their aviation division. And so they primarily focus on building uh, airports, well, funding uh, the development of airports. And so then that was one way to kind of use my degree to get back into this space. And so uh, really kind of got back into helping airports, both large and small, uh, grow and, and, you know, maintain them. And then it turns out while I was there um, at North Carolina DOT, um, an opportunity arose to help start the UAS program there uh, for North Carolina. And at that point, I'd never flown a drone before in my life. Um, and we were working with, uh, with some folks in the state, including NC State. And so um, the North Carolina legislature had asked them to, you know, start this drone program and, and some other items they needed and tasks they had to do. And they didn't have anyone to really start that and kind of just volunteered like, hey, I'll do what I'm doing on the airport development side, but also help out on the on this new drone program and figured I'd probably need to go fly drone at that point. And so that's when I really kind of got into into drones. And of course, when 2016 rolled around. I was able to get my um, my drone pilot license, and you know, at that point, our task was to help kind of develop the entire drone program in North Carolina, including how the department used it, as well as how we uh, attracted commercial, um, you know, commercial partners. So, yep, that passion for aviation kind of led, uh, of course, from uh, from the airport side over to the drone side. Awesome. So you are the vice president for, is it HovCon? Yep, HovCon. Uh, HovCon Consulting. Um, so can you tell me a little bit more or us a little bit more about what the company does and what is your involvement? Yeah, so often I get the question, um, you know, where did HovCon come from, that name? And so I'm, um, I'm part one side of my family is Hawaiian Chinese. The other side of my family is Norwegian. And so it really comes from my Norwegian side of the family. And Hoverslin, Norway, is where my great-grandfather left from when he uh, moved to the, to the U.S. And my grandfather was someone I looked up to. And so it's actually short for Hoverslin, Hoverslin Consulting. So um, any, any Norwegians out there might – well, Hoverslin is a very small <laughs> town in Norway – but that's HoveCon, and that consulting firm uh, started back in 2016. So as I noted, I was a state employee, a full-time state employee, and I decided um, I wanted to leave and share some of the knowledge I'd learned as a state employee with others 
And so I left in 2015, started uh, the consulting firm Hocon in 2016. And one of my contracts, um, you know, immediately after that was with NCDOT. And I, I came back and was an embedded um, consultant with North Carolina DOT as a UAS program manager. But we expanded over time as well and serve a variety of different state and local governments. So we're, you know, working with Wyoming DOT and a variety of other airports that want to develop uh, programs, airports in local cities. And so that's that's really the services of, of HopeCon. If you want to get, you know, a waiver, let's say a Beyond Visual Line of Sight Bridge Inspection Waiver, we have the history. We helped NCDOT work with Skydio to get that. Um, or if you're just looking as a as a local government and you want to start a drone program, we help build the policy, the procedures, the safety management system, and do the training. So uh, it's a pretty small group. There's about um, eight of us right now, but uh, when we're spread out all over, and so yeah, it's been a really exciting um, experience to to go into the consulting world after uh, being a government employee. Well. Um... I got uh, I got another question here. I mean, I was looking at your your LinkedIn profile just now, and I saw that uh, besides all those things, you're also uh, part time involved as the president of AeroX and then also AeroX Ventures. Can you tell us a little bit more about those two uh, initiatives? Well, probably like all of us, if you have a passion for aviation or drones, you kind of you you volunteer for a lot of things and you get involved in a lot of things. I think we all want to see this um, this industry grow. So. The nonprofit AeroX is an initiative in Winston Salem, North Carolina, and um, that is that nonprofit is working with local um, medical partners like Novant Healthcare and um, Atrium Wake Forest Baptist Hospital. So they have a presence in in uh, Winston Salem. They are using drones and they want to expand that footprint. And so what AeroX is focused on is really establishing a localized unmanned traffic management system in the city of Winston-Salem. And so we've asked the legislature for some funding, uh, capital investment in in a ground-based radar system. And the plan is to then build a safety case so that folks that want to come fly within the the city of Winston-Salem, we can partner with them to get them access to a variety of different uh, data, including uh, airspace um, surveillance through a ground-based radar system, or weather, or um, you know other other uh, other things like GPS integrity, um, uh, cell coverage, etc. So we're really excited about that initiative. I think what's what I'm most excited about is that we have these healthcare partners that are really kind of leading mm-hmm. um, leading that charge. So at the end of the day, these guys, you know, they're paying for those services and that's who you need involved in these conversations. It is definitely. Oh, very so then also, I mean, especially- go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so then you also asked about, uh, AirX, the venture fund. And so, um, I co-founded that fund with, uh, three others where the, um, the general partners that have, you know, put our own money and are now fundraising toward um, a goal of about 50 million for this first fund. And we're focused on advanced um, air mobility. So not only UAS and all the software and, and uh, manufacturing capability that go along with that, but also looking at air taxis um, or other kind of automated or autonomous systems on aircraft. So uh, really excited for that to be kind of the next <laughs> next phase for me and focusing my time and effort Mm -hmm. and hopefully bringing my experience from regulations and some of these other programs to to help startups and really let them grow in this space. I think it's definitely cool. I mean, if you look at uh, the healthcare system and drone deliveries, I mean, we've seen some examples where organs have been uh, transported by drones and as well for uh, COVID uh, samples as well test samples. I mean, I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, in that localized UTM project, is the FEA involved at all in that as well? Or is that something that is run purely local? No, the FAA, um, as we know, FAA needs to definitely to be involved. Um, and so the, the safety case that we're building around, uh, you know, using a ground-based radar system, the FAA is, is commenting and and ultimately, we need their buy off. Um, last thing you want to do is spend a couple million dollars on a radar system to find out that FAA is like, well, I don't really know if that's the right radar you need to be using. So um, at the same time, FAA is not going to give us a thumbs up and a, a seal of approval if you don't have the equipment and you haven't validated it. So 
it's definitely a close uh, relationship that we're uh, that we have and and that we're continuing to to foster to to solve this problem. And I think solving it in a kind of a small urban area like Winston Salem. Um, that has an airport close to the downtown. So part of the airspace is, is class the or controlled airspace. Um, and we have active partners already flying. Uh, I think that kind of gives us a leg up with, uh, with FAA. So speaking of this, let's talk about the IPP, which is the UAS Integration Pilot Program that the FAA created back in, I think it was 2020. And I know you were involved with this with the North Carolina the DOT. Can you tell us how you were involved, kind of what your team did, and then how you contributed to the program? Yeah, so um, the U.S. Integration Pilot Program, we had heard rumblings in 2017, you know, that this program was going to come out. And, um, and so sure enough, uh, November of, I think 2017, no, it was October of 2017, uh, at the time president Trump signed uh, a presidential memorandum to kick this program off. And so we had essentially from the time that memo got, um, signed until I think it was January 4th. So about three months to write a proposal. And, uh, so it was a proposal process that you need to submit. And I know there were over a hundred submissions um, that ended up getting uh, pushed in there. But what, at, you know, during those three months, we were trying to figure out, all right, how do we differentiate ourselves from, you know, our competitors? And, um, you know, we thought of the presence of a lot of different pharmaceutical and healthcare industry partners in the Raleigh area of North Carolina. And so we were fortunate to be connected with folks like Zipline, um, Matternet, who I would, you know, embarrassingly, and I kept saying Matterhorn every time I'd meet with them. They're like, no, it's, it's Matternet Basil. Um, they did, luckily, they didn't hold that against me and still were part of our proposal. But, we, you know, Matternet was operating in Switzerland at the time. Zipline was operating in, um, in Africa. And so we pulled them onto our team um, and we said, all right, we want to focus on medical package delivery. And, and then there were a couple others that wanted to join as well. Flytrex, which is an Israeli company that was delivering food um, in Holly Springs, which is a local town there. And then we got really lucky. We actually had Apple, um, Apple on our team as well. And so we felt like we had a pretty strong proposal. There were a couple of folks that um, we were we were told we probably want to avoid, um, which you can guess who those companies were. Um, and uh, because they weren't picked up on the on any of the proposals, and so we decided, all right, we'll remove some of those folks. And uh, and so we submitted our proposal. And frankly, I'll, I'll have to mention AirMap and give them a lot of credit. I mean, if you notice, AirMap was on like I think eight of the ten that were selected. And you know, we were really worked closely with AirMap to figure out what do we think really think the FA wants. And so we were selected um, as, as part of the 10 participants, and that kicked off in, uh, in let's see, June of 2018. And so that wrapped up October of last year, October of, of 2020. And so we had about you know two and a half years. It was, it was really a three-year program. Once we got up and running, it was about two and a half years. And some of our accomplishments there was, um, well, you asked about what was my role. So I was... Um, at the time, UAS program manager. So I kind of led the whole program for the North Carolina Department of Transportation and then um, led that whole initiative as well for um, the integration pilot program. And I had a couple other folks that um, helped me out with that. One of those was Tom Davis, who I got connected with. Um, he had just retired from NASA, had a, you know, had a full career at NASA, knew how to partner with FAA. Um, and was interested in drones. He moved from California to Raleigh, and so we he joined our team. Um, and then we had Dash. Uh, uh, I think you had Dash on here a little while ago, Dash Devakran, yeah. and um, and others uh, that were helping support this effort. Randy Breedlove. He's a he's a name uh, known in North Carolina. Um, he had a full career at FA as well. So we had a really good kind of administrative team, and then we got really fortunate to have great team partners. So at the end of that three years, we were able to have the first routine medical um, package delivery operation established here in um, in North Carolina. So in um, in March of 2019, they, UPS started flying with Matternet at Wake Med, and they flew they flew Monday through Friday, nine to five, every hour on the hour, and 
we got a lot of data from that particular flight. UPS got their 135. They actually had the first 135 drone delivery operation um, in North Carolina with UPS. An interesting fact about that is they had an all-women crew that um, that conducted that first flight. So two women pilots and um, and a mechanic. And so it's pretty exciting to think back, like the first official, you know, kind of drone delivery flight under this section part 135 um, was was all women. And, you know, uh, congratulate UPS for kind of understanding the importance of having more women in uh, aviation, especially in UAS. And then we also um, had some other great accomplishments. We were able to use uh, drones to help with the COVID pandemic. So Zipline was flying for Novant. Um, They're flying PPE. Uh, down in Kannapolis. And then um, we had uh, Valancey flying for Merck. Merck is a pharmaceutical company, and they were flying uh, vaccines from their pharmaceutical plant to a local clinic. Um, and those, again, they're all routine flights. These were like on schedule happening, you know, every day or Monday through Friday. And then we had um, UPS flying in Winston-Salem as well with Wake Forest Baptist Hospital delivering infusions so, you know, there was a infusion they would mix up in the pharmacy. You had to be infused in your body within one hour. They put it on a drone, fly it over to the clinic where um, you would take that infusion. And then on the way back, they'd be able to fly specimens and blood samples. Um, and then also we kind of pivoted in working with Flytrex and Causey Aviation. Uh, Walmart launched uh, a few locations. So we had, um, you know, Walmart uh, using drone delivery to deliver from a local store to a neighborhood near that store. And when we think about the impacts there for COVID, you know, folks were sheltering in place. And so I don't know about you guys, but I was using DoorDash, Grubhub, a lot more than I would have pre, pre-COVID, especially since a lot of the restaurants were closed. And now this was another mechanism um, with the drone delivery to deliver, you know, critical items that you may need from a Walmart and including some local restaurants to your home. So we were really excited when we looked at the data at the end of that program, uh, You know, we were around, well, over half of the flights that were submitted under that program came from uh, North Carolina. We're competing, of course, with nine others for that. So we got, again, this is not me bragging at all. It's really the partners we had and the customers that were willing to pay for their service that really made that a success. I think it's awesome. I mean, a lot of times when, uh, even on, on this show, when we spoke to brief, uh, people previously, uh, Texas kind of surfaces as one of the states that is very uh, at the front line of, of uh, using drones uh, for commercial purposes. Uh, but if I just hear you list uh, all these projects in North Carolina, there's been a lot going on in North Carolina. I think that's, mm-hmm. uh, that's really amazing. Um, I want to start talking about the Beyond program. But before we go there, you mentioned that Apple uh, got involved as well. Can you tell us more about how and why Apple got involved in the IPP in North Carolina? Yeah. So um, the, there's a legislative affairs um, uh, officer, I guess is what you, his official title was, um, that was actually from North Carolina that worked at Apple. And so during this proposal process, um, you know, I – Google Wing was someone else we we reached out to, but I was like, I don't know if anyone's talking to Apple, and I had no idea if they're even flying drones. And it turned out they they were flying drones. They're very secretive about, of course, a lot of what they did, and so it was like pulling teeth just to get something on a proposal that you know they were willing for us to share. It was just it was it was like pulling teeth just to get you know any information out of them. But they definitely were interested in kind of being on the proposal and being part of this program. There are a lot of unknowns. And so what we wrote in our proposal was that um, they were very interested in, um, you know, gathering data from uh, different platforms, including drones, to help serve their Maps app. So if you remember when Apple launched Maps, um, it kind of fell flat, right? And so they're like, well, we got to figure out other ways we can collect data and just, you know, and, and, you know improve the traffic and, um, you know, modeling that we have on our platform. And so... You know, drones was one of those platforms that they were interested in gathering that data. We got selected. And um, once we started getting, you know, flights up and running, we asked them if they wanted to come to North Carolina and fly. And um, they're like, well, really, we're, you know, they're focused on a couple other areas that they wanted to fly in California and, and up along the West Coast. And, you know, we're telling them, well, you actually kind of have to fly in North Carolina to be part of the, <laughs> the program. That's kind of their focus. North Carolina and they're like okay well 
So it turned out we never were able to get him to come out and fly during those those three years. And, you know, just, you know, I think it was recently that, right, there was a patent that just got released where we continue to see Apple move in the space, right, in this drone space. So that's about all I know, um, you know, when it comes to peeling the curtain behind the scenes of what Apple's doing with drones. Um, they're definitely yeah. interested in working on it, but we never got to fly in North Carolina. Yeah, I know that uh, for Apple improving their maps uh, has been a big deal and continues to be a big deal. So it makes sense for them to be interested in drones, I guess. Uh, now that the original IPP program is uh, a done deal, basically, and they've moved on to the Beyond program, I understand that you play a role in that as well. Okay, tell us a little bit about what the Beyond program from the FEA is about and, and what you guys are doing in North Carolina. Yeah, so as the, as the IPP or the Integration Pilot Program kind of wrapped up, they recognized they hadn't really met, um, you know, a lot of the goals they wanted to. For example, they wanted to fly beyond visual line of sight. And so one of the things I didn't mention that we did under the IPP was we got the first um, beyond visual line of sight bridge waiver. So this was like the first kind of true BB loss waiver. A lot of the BB loss waivers we see, you still have to have someone clearing the airspace, right? They still need to be looking around to make sure there's no aircraft coming in. So you're just waiving the fact that you have to see the drone. Well. You know, for this, we were not going to be able to see the drone and we didn't really want to clear the airspace either since we were flying underneath the bridge. And so we were able to get that approval. I will have to say that that was an interesting waiver to get. Um, you know, our <laughs> when we were getting that waiver, you know, you're talking to FAA and, and talking about the safety case you have. And they're like, well, I really think you need someone that's just looking around to make sure no aircraft are approaching. And we're like, we're flying under the bridge. Like, no, no one's flying under a bridge with a airplane well as it turns out sure enough a lady in ohio flies underneath a bridge and then gets in trouble with the fa over it and so anyhow we end up getting that waiver with no nobody to have to clear the to clear the airspace it was really a true bb loss waiver but that was there was only a handful of waivers like that under the ipp program that were approved and so back to your question about beyond beyond was going to look at just that beyond visual line of sight how do we really commercialize beyond visual line of sight and they and they started this work with these partners so they said sure let's continue this work it'll be under a new name um, because of course the presidential memorandum you know said that they had to stop the ipp so they stopped the ipp they invited all the participants that were on the um, ipp to the beyond program um, at that time there were only nine uh, one of the original 10 had dropped out, and that was the Lee County Mosquito District in Florida. They dropped out. And then of the nine that were asked to participate, eight transferred over. City of San Diego, which was on the IPP, didn't end up joining the Beyond program. And so the Beyond program has been really kind of a continuation for us in North Carolina. All the same partners we had on the original IPP um, program, we added to our Beyond uh, program. And then we've also added a few new ones as well, including, um, you know, recently we've added X-Wing. So if you're familiar with X-Wing, um, if you watch any of the Star Wars series, no. If you, X-Wing, as you know, is the uh, is where they're taking, you know, existing type certified aircraft and putting, uh, you know, some automation and uh, remotely piloting them. And so we're excited to both have small drones, right? You know, 55 pounds and under and, you know, larger ones all the way up to kind of you know, potentially flying this caravan, Cessna caravan is optionally piloted in our airspace. And my role now, I'm, I'm contracted back to lead that program. So I'm the Beyond uh, Program Manager there at North Carolina DOT. Um, and it's kind of, it's really just a, a part-time role that I fill uh, as we continue to work toward our goals under the Beyond Program. I think it's so awesome that it was all women who did that maiden UPS um, delivery flight. I had no idea. So thank you for sharing that. I think that's super cool. We'll have to have some of them on the show. Um, but getting on to it, a big portion of integrating UAS into national airspace um, relies on remote ID. Um, so can you just tell us what role you think remote ID is just going to play um, in that goal going forward? Yeah, there's been a lot of hype around um, remote ID as, um, you know, I think back to some of the conversations we had in the early days of the, of the IPP when we wanted, to, when we talked about being able to fly beyond visual line of sight. And so some of the comments we were getting back from FA was, 
well, we got to figure out this remote ID, um, you know, what, what that requirement is going to look like. And of course it's out now and, and we have um, some requirements in place for when uh, everyone needs to be broadcasting in the future. I think this is a really great uh, step forward for the industry as a whole. Um, you know, when we think about UTM, well, there's a lot of different things. So maybe I'll start with even at a local level. Um, you know, we, we've seen a lot of state and local governments um, enact laws around UAS. And so, uh, you know, there's obviously a lot of legitimate concerns. You know, in North Carolina, there's a law around, um, you know, using a flying a drone near a prison. Um, they have, we've seen drones and, and have captured and have you know documented drones being used to smuggle contraband into prisons, um, and so that's an example of uh, you know the, the role that remote ID could potentially play in the future um, in helping understand drones flying around uh, these confinement facilities or prisons. Sometimes these are right in the middle of of cities, right? And there's other folks that want to be flying. You know, maybe an energy company wants to be flying because they're inspecting a line. And so if they're able to broadcast, you know, who they are and their intention, uh, someone like a, uh, a correctional facility will be able to understand, all right, this is not someone we need to worry about. It's a, you know, it's a utility company flying here. But if someone should be broadcasting and they, they see a drone and they're not broadcasting, there's going to be more concern um, and focus on that particular individual. Uh, so that's kind of at a, you know, a local level. But when we think about building this UTM system, we kind of needed somewhere to start as well. Uh, and so folks being able to broadcast again who they are um, and their intentions is going to be very helpful um, as well. And so we're trying to figure out a way to integrate that now into kind of the entire system. What sensors do we need to have on the ground um, or, you know, is it going to be through a network? And I think, you know, having sensors on the ground in a city, understanding where folks are flying will be very helpful for a variety of different reasons. Um, again, public safety at a local level, um, as well as kind of figuring out how we can fly beyond visual line of sight in the future. So, um, so yeah, I think there's, I think there's a lot of potential, um, and, and, uh, we're excited to see the adoption. I will note that, <laughs> you know, remote ID came out. We have a couple partners we're working with, um, in the certification process to get their, their UAS certified. And so, again, uh, they're going to have to go back and see how do they add on that, you know, correct module for their particular um, platform they're being, that's being certified. So, I, overall, I think it's a great, um, you know, progress for the industry. I think it's great, again, for local and, and state governments as well, kind of have an understanding of what's happening in their community. Um, any major partners that you can reveal or we should know about? Well, we um, we're still under NDA with I think all of them, so not not quite okay. yet. <laughs> that we can all share. right. It's all good. Now you mentioned remote ID. The location of the aircraft is critical for uh, you know the integration into the airspace. How about the location of the pilot, which is you know one of the very controversial piece of the regulation where the location of the pilot is going to be available to the general public. Uh, do you think that can create an issue for the drone pilots getting harassed because their location is broadcasted to everyone and anyone? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I don't, I don't know. Well, there's a couple of comments I'll make. You know, we talk with folks like the UPS and others that are doing drone delivery, Zipline and COSD. Um, aviation and fly treks and, and Valancey. Honestly, their plan in the long term is to have a pilot, um, you know, remotely at a at a place that they're operating multiple drones, right? And so, in in some cases, like drone delivery, the pilot location they could be flying, let's say, in Winston Salem, but the pilot location for that aircraft may be in, you know, it could be on the West Coast, it could be in um, in DC, it could be where you guys. Where you are, so it may not be um, within close proximity of to where the operation is taking place. But um, you know, I think when we think about other operations um, like uh, utility inspection or uh, tower inspection or real estate photography, um, I think there there needs to be some questions asked about, like you said, the safety of an individual, um, especially when the police. 
um, maybe are called or public safety is involved. I mean, we've talked with a lot of um, we've talked with a lot of local public safety officials in North Carolina. When I was wearing the hat of UAS program manager, we get calls about, hey, there's a drone flying over my house. I want to know who's flying it. And, you know, we'll talk to the police and they'll say, we don't know who's flying it. Like, do you have any recommendations? And of course, the recommendation at the time is, yeah, more than likely it's not going to fly for longer than 20 minutes to so just hang around and see where the drone goes and lands. And that's probably where you'll find the individual. So um, I think if it, it depends on who has access to um, to that data. I do think there's value in, of course, public safety having access to that data. But uh, I'm not entirely sure that it's going to be super valuable. Uh, for individuals. Um, so I guess I'm really kind of treading around your question beyond, to be, to be honest, it's a, it's a good question that I don't think I really have, have the right answer for. No, I understand. I don't think any of us have the answer quite frankly. So no, I, I think one of the, the problems here is that remote ID is almost like a one size fits all situation. Right. Um, and I think if you look at the different use cases for drones, I mean, if you look at, um, uh, Google uh, with Wing, for instance, or you look at what Amazon is planning on doing and you compare that to, let's say, hobbyist drone pilots or FPV drone pilots. I mean, we're flying drones in very different ways and, and in very different circumstances with also very different kinds of drones. And I think Remote ID right now doesn't really allow for, for all those different use cases because they have like one solution that is supposed to fit for everybody. Uh, what, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, it's a great it's a great comment. You know, one of the things we heard from... Um, you know, the drone delivery partners, what they're, they're concerned about uh, broadcasting their location and people being able to understand, um, you know, where, how many neighborhoods that they're flying to and, and aggregating a lot of that data about flights, right? And uh, is, and how that intelligence from all that uh, data aggregation would help, um, you know, their competitors. And it's interesting because there are folks that, that will follow, you um, you know, transponder and ADSB, well, really ADSB, uh, and, and follow where these large corporations, their jets are flying because they want to know, you know, potential <laughs> mergers and acquisitions that what company are they talking to? They might potentially merge with because they want to obviously buy that company, um, some stock in that company before it's purchased by another large company because that value could go up. So there's a lot of, a lot that you can do with that data. Uh, when it comes to the commercial side. Um, but we, you know, we definitely want to encourage folks to fly recreationally and I think undo burden on on folks that are flying for fun. Um, we want to be very careful of because almost, well, lots of us that got into this industry, um, and, and again, this wasn't me, but I, others that I know flew for fun, right? They, they, and I, I fly for fun now too. I have a dream that I fly just uh, with my kids, but a lot of folks to get in this industry, they flew for fun and they realized this is a, a really great tool that I can use for a variety of different things. And so we want to make sure that we don't have a, a, you know, a high hurdle um, or barrier to entry um, for the technology that's required for these folks to enjoy drone, um, you know, flying as a hobbyist and where they can fly. Right. So obviously free as, as you know, areas that yeah. are designated for folks that don't have to have remote ID, um, is an area they can fly, but, um, you know, lots of other questions to answer around that, but yeah, the one size fits all, I think is maybe classic FAA, um, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. applying part 135, which is unscheduled air carrier service. Think of your, you know, your typical chartered aircraft, applying that to drone delivery is not a, you know, this is another example of, we're just going to take something we have and try to apply it to as many things as we can. So do you think drone deliveries will help make drones more accepted to the public? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think there's, I think medical package delivery uh, has really helped with that perception. So, um, you know, we think about retail package delivery to your home. Um, it, there's certainly folks that, would be potentially annoyed by someone getting a drone, delivering a bunch of stuff to their house um, and any any noise, which I know is very a low impact uh, to them or, or visually seen it. But if, um, but, you know, starting with drone delivery for uh, medical use cases where we're saying, hey, 
we're, t- you know, we're potentially saving a life by this, this delivery, or we're improving healthcare outcomes, I think was, um, you know, that was our focus under IPP. And, and I think that was what really got folks excited about drone delivery. And there's a lot we can learn from having these fixed locations within a, a medical campus or kind of a medical network to start delivering um, items um, for customers um, like these healthcare institutions who are willing to pay. Uh, and then some of the lessons learned from that can certainly be applied to retail kind of package delivery. So you have to look at kind of the, the, the whole picture. I mean, you know, lots of other use cases we can think about, like, um, you know, flying critical tools are, uh, are critical components um, out to someone who's working in the field. We think about, uh, you know, drone delivery to the, to the oil platforms in the Gulf of Mexico or someone's deep in the woods and you're using a drone to deliver you know, a critical item that they need, whether that's, uh, you know, they need it personally for their health or they need it for their vehicle or car or something broke down. Um, we see a lot of potential. And then, of course, natural disasters, whether that's um, the devastating wildfires or, um, you know, uh, earthquakes or even, you know, in North Carolina, we had a lot of hurricanes. Um, there's a there's a great use case for delivering critical items uh, via drone delivery as well. So this is kind of all of the same equipment can be used in those different um, missions. Uh, and so it just helps the more operations we can fly can, I think, builds this um, builds this ecosystem and lowers the price. Because at the end of the day, we will have to make a decision. If I'm ordering something from Amazon, do I want this today via drone delivery or can I wait for next day or two days? And so uh, we need to get the cost low enough that it's really competitive. Um, And a follow up I have on this is I've heard some concerns voiced that as drone deliveries become more common, it could potentially um, restrict flights for recreational or um, even commercial operators that aren't in delivery. Do you agree with that? Do you think there's going to be a threat? at all? Or is it going to impact um, where people can fly, especially in urban areas, yeah. I would add? I, yeah, I think definitely in urban areas, it would it, we'd have to look at the data. Um, I mean, I'll be honest, there's a lot of airspace out there. And when we think about um, package delivery, uh, they are going to definitely be at a higher, well, all, they already have to meet a higher bar of safety um, including the ability to detect where other aircraft are. And, and so back to my kind of previous point, we're just going to have to see where the numbers shake out and what someone's going to be willing to pay for um, will really drive the adoption of who will be ordering um, and, and having things delivered to their homes. And, um, and so if the numbers are not as high as we think they are, this may not be an issue, right? Um, and then I think it's important, though, when if, if I'm a company that's doing drone delivery and I know that there's an area that, you know, is an established FRIA or it is an area, you know, where folks are allowed to or are focused on flying drones or, you know, flying clubs or parks, you're going to want to avoid those areas as well um, so that you can you can deliver drone or sorry, deliver the packages. But I think that, you know, really it's going to be on the drone delivery companies to ensure that they're operating in a safe manner, especially if they're flying beyond visual line of sight. Um, so I'm not, I don't know if that is going to be a concern or not. We're just going to have to see how many people, uh, you know, it's going to be competing with a lot of things like autonomous vehicles on the ground, delivering food in the future. You know, they're, they're looking at these kind of small terrestrial robots and that are, you know, on the sidewalk now as well. So there's going to be a lot of competition in this drone space for drone delivery. So you, you're very involved with UAM, Urban Air Mobility, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes here. Uh, but the do you think UAM combined with the impact of large scale operation like drone delivery, for example, is going to have an impact on noise in especially in urban environments? Um, is this something that you have been concerned with or, or that you're working towards or see any projects that are working on that? Yeah, so I am not I don't think noise is going to be a concern. I think traditionally in aviation, we've we think about noise and it's been a huge focus, um, you know, really ever since the turbine engine. Um, well, even before the turbine engine, because we have a court case here in, in North Carolina where there was someone flying 
um, you know, into into an, uh, a Navy base, I think, and the guys' chickens were being scared from the noise. But noise certainly has always been an issue around airports. I saw that before I got into drones working on the airport side. And so naturally, folks think of the noise associated with uh, with drones or even EV tolls. But um, there's a couple of things that I think are driving why they're not as, as noisy. Um, one is they're obviously lighter. Um, they're lighter and um, and then they're electric powered. And for, so you're getting a reduction in obviously a turbine engine um, and they're lighter. So it's not a, as heavy um, of an aircraft, which as we know, the heavier aircraft get, it's also going to be louder, especially for, um, you know, rotors on the, on the, um, on a helicopter. Um, and they've made some improvements on, of course, the blade design as well. But we would, you know, all of these places I mentioned in North Carolina that we've been flying, I've been to the sites, I've seen them. And as soon as they transition out of kind of, you know, the vertical takeoff or landing portion and start flying, you can't even hear them. And you really can't hear them in urban areas. So I think of that first flight at Wake Med where they're flying routinely. I mean, they're flying over roads and you would really have to uh, listen hard to be able to pick it up. But there's a lot of other ambient noise that's being picked up. And then, um, you know, one other thing I didn't mention was uh, in in January of 2000 um, or in January of 2020, we let's see, was it 2020 or was it 2019? It's all blending together now. We we partnered with Ehang. Uh, it was 2020. Ehang to fly their EV toll. So if you remember, uh, mm-hmm. Ehang 216, it has 16 uh, propellers on it. Um, it's electric powered. And, you know, that was really silent. I mean, it was a lot quieter than a helicopter. And so, again, I think about the noise is primarily in that takeoff or landing portion of the flight. But when they're transitioning in flight um, and flying, they're, they're very, you know, the, the noise impact is, is really not there. And you've seen this from Joby, right? You know, Joby had the video yeah. um, where Joe Ben was out there and he's talking to the camera and, and their aircraft is taking off behind him and it's really quiet. You talked about initiatives and under the beyond program, we actually FAA came out and did some testing in Liberty, North Carolina, and we flew three different drones and it was a complete setup. I don't know. I think there was probably 12 or more microphones. They had arrayed. We had a crane there that had microphones hanging off of, you know, of the crane all the way up to hundred feet. And it was the, it was the noise profile process that they use for everything from, you know, F 35s to helicopters um, and so we followed that same procedure and flew three different platforms there so they could gather that data. So we're waiting on FAA to kind of, that this was this summer, they've told us they're looking through that data and they're developing noise profiles. And so we'll be able to see like really what is the decibel level and how does this noise impact fit into their traditional models of how they, you know, model noise in communities. You know, they've done that for, for years with airports and, um, and then how helicopters and your traditional aircraft. So I'm hoping we're going to get some good guidance from FAA soon around that. Good to hear. So we started uh, talking about urban air mobility. Can you explain to our audience uh, what that's all about, what kind of aircraft are involved and what the challenges are and where basically the technology is nowadays? Yeah, so urban air mobility um, has has changed its name recently. It's now called um, Advanced Air Mobility, and um, and really this is this is the electrification of uh, of aircraft um, and flying really serving areas that have not been served by traditional aircraft. So, you know, uh, we think of where helicopters have traditionally played a role, or um, you know, small aircraft moving people have played a role flying in and out of general aviation airports. This new vertical and takeoff capability of an electric platform that can potentially carry passengers, but also can carry freight and, and a variety of other things, is really disrupting how we're going to be moving um, in, for example, urban areas. So that's why it kind of started out as urban air mobility. But they recognize there's there's a great potential for rural areas too. Um, you know, we think of again. I'll go back to healthcare. We think of folks that are in. Um, that are mobility impaired that live in rural areas. And we've seen kind of a, a centralization of healthcare institutions, you know, flying an EV toll out and landing close to them where they can get on that aircraft and fly to a hospital or to a clinic to, to 
you know, have access to healthcare, I think is, is a great use case. So NASA saw, look, let's expand it beyond urban air mobility to kind of, um, you know, this regional aspect as well and, and kind of change it to AM. Um, and so everything, I guess, from in, in my perspective, and, and again, this kind of is also NASA kind of coined the term of AM, you know, it's everything from drones all the way up to kind of to the, the larger um, uh, platforms that we would traditionally call air taxi systems so moving people. So the state of the industry, well, we've seen a, we've seen a ton of money dumped. Um, I shouldn't say dumped. It's been invested. We've seen a ton of money invested into this industry. I mean, you know, we had uh, two SPACs just in the last uh, year, um, both Joby and Archer uh, going public via a SPAC. Um, you know, this is in the billions of dollars that we're seeing invested into this space. And so and kind of the big hurdle right now we see is certification. Um, and we, we, we also see this on the UAS side, the kind of the drone side. But these these systems like Joby and Archer and Lilium and Volocopter and others need to be certified. And FAA is really trying to wrap their head around how do we certify an electric vehicle and how do we certify a vertical or takeoff landing, you know, electric vehicle. So it's it's totally outside of their box and they're having to think very you know, outside the box and, and about this new innovative technology. So we don't have anyone that's certified to fly those platforms yet. So a lot of, you know, a lot of testing going on. And, um, and we're also seeing a pretty large investment by the military in the space as well. And through programs like Agility Prime, they want to help take that burden of certification and unknown, um, you know, the, the unknown of making it through certification. They want to take a little bit of that burden off of them and, and put them under contract with the Department of Defense and work with them to develop a vertical flight capability within the military. So, um, so really, Department of Defense is helping kind of this AM space. And the numbers we hear, uh, well, the dates we hear is, you know, potentially we'll see flights next year. But I think if you're asking me, I don't think we'll see flights until 2025. Um, when I say flights, I mean routine flights where people are flying, um, again, with certified vehicles. I know there's folks like Lyft that are flying under the ultralight rules, but um, I think we're still, you know, two to three years away. So I, I have a I, I, I'd be curious to what your I mean, guys' opinion. I would be curious to what, what your guys' opinion are because, um, you know, you're obviously in this space as well. And uh, often we hear, oh, we're just around the corner, but you know, realistically, I don't know, what are your guys' thoughts about how far away we are? Well, that might tie into uh, to my next, uh, my follow-up question as well. I mean, um, with the drone industry itself moving so fast, and then we're not even talking about urban air mobility and all the air taxis and stuff, uh, is the FAA really equipped to follow up as quickly as that industry is moving forward and, and breaking new grounds? And I wonder if they are. I mean, I think you already see that with remote ID where we have a one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, I think the FEA is, is behind the developments and it, see, it takes them years to, to get to remote ID for drones. With the other things that are, help, uh, that are changing, like urban air mobility, uh, I just wonder how they're going to catch up. And uh, I guess then secondly, it comes to the question, when do they catch up? So I think it's going to be years as well. I mean, uh, we heard uh, Jeff Bezos say, what was it, 2013, I think, that uh, drone yeah. deliveries would become a routine uh, experience for people. And now here we are in 2021. It's far from being routine. Uh, it's happening for sure, but it's it's not as widespread. So um, that's my opinion. Um, what do you think? Is, is the FEA equipped to to move as quickly as needed uh, to support this this fast growing industry? No, I, I don't think they are. And you know, we've worked closely with FAA, and it's and we worked with them, some really great people there. But they certainly are res resource constrained when it comes to integrating UAS in. Um, but then also, there's just kind of. They are not. They were never really set up for a technology that evolves as quickly. You know, we think about traditional aircraft and it being a ten-year process to roll out a new airliner or a new aircraft. And well, shoot, every twelve months we're seeing a new model <laughs> of a drone coming out. And so the the partners that you know we're working with on the Beyond program that are going through the certification process, Matternet, Zipline, and Flytrex. 
you know, they've been working on this since the IPP. So they're already about three years in and they still, you know, I'm not sure if we see a light at the end of the tunnel for them to be certified. And what's happened is because it's so new, you know, every time you kind of turn a stone over, you find something else. Oh, well, we didn't even think about this. Oh, we didn't even think about, do we need to certify the ground control station to the same standards that we need to the aircraft that's flying in the sky? Um, you know, that's something that happened just this year. They had to make a decision on that. So there's lots of kind of processes and procedures that I think are holding them back as well. Um, and then, you know, there's there's also this other component that is the ability for them to take on any type of risk. And um, so we think about this, well, we definitely saw this when we were getting waivers. They, they weren't, they were definitely risk adverse, but if we're trying to integrate, you know, a, a technology that's advanced and there are going to be some unknowns, we don't know all of the, the capabilities, but we want to be able to integrate it. So we build that data. And so if we can't approve a flight to, to fly beyond visual line of sight or over people to build the reliability data, well, then we're not going to make any progress. So I think those are the three things that are really holding them back. One is just resources. So just having the manpower. The second is processes and procedures to actually work with a new innovative um, technology. And then the third is kind of being so risk adverse that it really kind of hampers the, the progress. So I you've have, been involved uh, one in- One more question that I want to- oh. It's okay, go, go for it, Haya. Can I squeeze one in, Kara? There's so much to talk about here, I think. <laughs> yes, yes. You, I, I think you, what, what you see awesome. happening... No, I think what you see happening is that uh, and Zipline, I think, is a great example. I mean, where where is most of their uh, drone delivery flights taking place? It's happening in Africa. And a big reason for that is that the regulation isn't as strict over there as it is here in the United States. Mm -hmm. So... Um, apart from the FAA having a hard time dealing with a industry that's moving so rapidly, I think there's also a risk of uh, new innovation just moving out of this country and developing elsewhere. And it might be in Africa, it could be it could be anywhere in the world where uh, regulations aren't so strict. Uh, is is that something, uh, Basil? You think we should be worried about? Is that innovation and technology and therefore talent as well moves out of the US to areas where drone technology is being used uh, more widely and in more innovative ways? Well, yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, there's a couple things I think to unpeel here. So one, you're definitely, so we have a zip, let's take it the zip line example. So we have a US based company that's operating overseas. They're building a product here, but they're having to operate overseas to understand, you know, and improve the product. You know, their goal of course is to fly in the US at one, at some point. Now, yeah. Um, in Africa, they, we don't have the same, or they don't have the same traffic density as as we do here in the U.S. So they they can be a little bit more lenient. And then something that really kind of is either I don't know if I'd say hinders the U.S., but it's just part of the fabric of this aviation community is we have a Class G airspace, which is uncontrolled airspace, and I can go out there and fly. And I don't have to talk to anybody and I can just look around outside, you know, out of my aircraft. And as long as I don't hit anyone else, I can fly in that no issue at all. And that's not found in a whole lot of places in the world. And in addition, I don't even need a license to fly in some, I could, you know, under these ultralight rules, I could go get a parachute and a, and you know, these, a backpack that has a lawnmower engine that's swinging a blade and it's considered a vehicle by FAA. And as long as I don't fly in controlled airspace, I can fly around as well. And so what that, so having that access to um, our airspace, both for, you know, at a recreational level um, in, in the class G airspace is great, right? That's, that's great. We can get more folks flying with less cost in, you know, what uh, the technology they're required. And so this is kind of the position you've seen AOPA take, but, um, but that also opens up, a lot of questions on how do we uh, fly drones in that same space. And so I think, I do think that's why we see a lot of folks going overseas. One reason is um, they can work with a regulator directly in maybe an area that's not as congested as a U.S. and fly that, it, you know, that's willing to, you know, partner with someone and take some risk. Um, in the, in the case of, of Zipline flying in Rwanda, I mean, they were able to just, provide tremendous improvements to how they distributed blood by those operations. So there's a huge benefit for them there. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, your question about, are we going to lose talent to go overseas? 
Um, I think we still see folks wanting, you know, the U.S. is where aviation started with the Wright brothers on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. You know, we've long had a leading position. I think our position is maybe called into question a little bit after the Boeing, um, you know, issue, 737 MAX issue. And, you know, I think we are going to potentially get behind. Well, we already are in some ways, I think, behind on the on integrating UAS. Um, but I think folks are still going to want to come to the U.S. because it's going to be the largest market. And we're known for, you know, being innovative. So um, I'm hoping we're not going to lose folks on a lot of startups that I've talked to. You know, they're also outside of the U.S. They definitely want to have a presence in the U.S. because they know if they can get their drone certified or their platform certified in the U.S., they can they can go to almost any other country in the world and hold up that certificate and be accepted. So we just got to keep that gold standard. So you have been involved in several efforts. Um as far as educating younger generations on the aviation industry, um, what, what does that entail and why is it important to you? Yeah, we've been, you know, really fortunate to work with youth, um, getting them excited about science in, in general, STEM or STEAM as it's called now uh, with adding arts in there um, and getting folks excited um, just getting them exposed to what their opportunities are after school or just exposed to technology in general um, is something that I'm, I'm definitely really passionate about and excited because um, I've talked to a lot of folks that have gotten into aviation or the UAS industry and they can pinpoint it to a certain conversation or a certain experience. Um, just talking with someone, you know, last a few weeks ago and they were working you know, in high school, they went and visited an air traffic control center and had no idea. You know, they never flown on a plane before in their life. But that particular experience really got them excited about aviation. And they ended up having an entire um, career in aviation. And so um, so that's why I think it's, it's really important to get kids excited about science, uh, using drones um, and, and aviation in general. And, you know, one thing we're definitely I'm, I'm definitely passionate about is just getting um, you know, a, a broader group of folks, a more diverse group of folks in aviation as well. So getting, you know, folks like I have three daughters, my daughter's excited about aviation. We definitely want to see more women in this space. Um, and, you know, if we can, you know, my goal is that if we can, you know, uh, have a diverse uh, group of folks in aviation, the, the same ver diverse group that aviation feeds, whether it's in the airline industry or on the, you know, UAS side, um, we want to make sure everyone is is included as we think about building this new ecosystem around advanced air mobility. So one of the um, you know one of the initiatives that we've helped out with is uh, these uh, summer camps, STEM summer camps. We just wrapped up one this year with Lawa, which is the uh, Los Angeles World Airports. Um, we had Greg. Greg came out. He actually gave away a couple of his uh, Part 107 classes, which is pretty exciting to some of those high school students. Um, and, you know, during those conversations, I'm always impressed. You know, these kids are thinking way ahead. They're thinking outside the box. Um, you know, we need these kids in FAA in the future, <laughs> to your point about getting them to, to adapt. Um, you know, they were thinking of all kinds of different use cases that we hadn't even we hadn't even thought of. Yeah. Um, and again, it's it's this going to future generation that's going to help build this new ecosystem. And so um, another kind of focus that we've had is our podcast. We also have a podcast mm -hmm. called No U Turn, and in that we're trying to you know, well, we just talk about transportation broadly. But uh, some of the the funds that we're raising through that podcast, we're developing a scholarship for folks that after high school, um, you know, to be able to get the Part 107 license or get into different aviation programs. So, um, you know, it's important to give back. I've been very fortunate to, to be where I am in my career and taking a little bit of, of what I have and giving back both my time and resources, I think is super important. And it just feels good, right? It feels really good to do it too. 
So we're getting towards the end of the show, and and we really appreciate your time in answering all these questions. This there's just so many topics that you're involved with that it's been hard to really pinpoint only one. Uh, but we always have one final question, which is, what is your favorite drone? Oof. What is my favorite drone? <clears throat> okay, so um, the favorite drone I have right now, I'll tell you what I'm. So I'll tell you my favorite drone, and then I'll tell you what drone I'm excited about. Hopefully, uh, my wife listens to this, and, and I pick this up this uh, holiday season. But my f- favorite drone I fly now is um, is a Parrot Disco. Um, I don't know you're familiar with this. It's like a fixed wing uh, made out of uh, made out of styrofoam, really light, but styrofoam, it is yeah. a blast to it's a blast to fly and um you know it comes with goggles of course you gotta have a visual observer make sure if you're flying under part 107 you're maintaining the visual line of sight but you can just get that thing down and it gets screaming across the ground and um that has been the most fun uh drone i've flown i'm looking forward to um my first well i have a small fpv drone now but i want to get a, a much larger fpv drone um i've been it's just impressive these cinematic fpv shots i've seen like it's it's amazing um and i hopefully can uh reproduce some of those i know carrie you're doing some great things on with photography and and drones and um i don't know if you've gotten into the fpv yet but i'm just super impressed by not only your photos but others that are taking these incredible shots and so that's a that's a hobby i want to start pursuing Oh, thank you so much. Um, I will admit that the first time I switched a DJI FPV drone into manual mode, it crashed. Um, (laughs) I tell anyone it is an entirely different experience. And I talked to a few other fellow reviewers and they said, oh, well, my rep sent me two because they were just expecting that to happen. I don't think people realize how difficult it is Um, because you're just constantly maneuvering the joysticks. You're not hovering unless you're in normal or sport mode with the DJI FPV drone. But a um, typical FPV drone, though, you are constantly maneuvering. And so um, I know Drone Racing League has um, a simulator and DJI created one. And I just tell people, go spend time in that simulation and, or um, learn to build something lightweight that if it crashes, it's more resilient. Um, while DJI has done a lot of great things with their FPV drone, if you do crash it, it's very likely that you are going to send it in and you should have DJI care as well. But that is something I do want to get really good at because um Cola FPV, Johnny FPV are just um, creating some phenomenal shots. And Johnny FPV just actually um, created a commercial with Mercedes. And so seeing artists like Justin Bieber and major brands embrace FPV drones um, is just really encouraging. So I think it's something who we did should the, all... um, Who did the commercial for the bowling alley where they're flying through that bowling alley? Jaybird Christmas. Have you seen this one recently? Oh my goodness. Oh, yeah. that I actually covered blew it. Blew my mind. Review. Yeah, and that was oh, um, that's great. I can't remember I can't remember the model he used, um, but more of a lightweight and um just something that he actually when you see it go in, I think, to the bowling pin area, he was it, yeah. he, he placed it in there, the drone fell in there, and then he was just able to get it out and keep flying. So just more of a resilient model. Um, I can't believe the model is, um, I'm blanking on it right now, but yes, uh, Jaybird Christensen does some phenomenal work. Um, him and his company, I think they're based out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yeah. They started wow. a whole new trend of, uh, of drone flying. So, all right. Well, Basil, yeah. it's, uh, we really appreciate your time today and talking to us about everything that you're involved with. It's definitely been a pleasure. Uh, for those of you that are interested in more information, Basil is on LinkedIn. Uh, they also have the no U-turn podcast that you can listen to on your favorite, uh, podcast provider. I tell you, I don't listen to many podcasts. I think I have three or four, but you guys are definitely on my list. So, uh, I listen to you when I run and when I do stuff around the house. And um, if you enjoyed the Pixel Drone Show, make sure that you subscribe. 
subscribe and share on social media as well. And we air every new show every Tuesday and um, we can be found on uh, podcast platforms and on YouTube. So thanks everyone. You have a great day and we'll see you guys next week. Thank you.